right. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, this year is the store's 40th anniversary, which is pretty amazing. Thanks for the came up. Last year when we were talking about <clears throat> the 40th coming up, we were like, man, that's we gotta do some cool stuff, you know. And so we put a list of things together, like this would be ideal to have, and actually everything's turned out just the way we wanted. Um, including having Dave Brown and Zach Broyles, Brown Pedals, Mythos Pedals in the same shop. Top it. carrying Mythos pedals for a few years now. We've done some really cool collaborations. Zach's gotten to be a good friend and we just we have a lot of fun like coming up with some of the new things that we do and I love everything that you make. And it's been a great relationship. This is the third time you've been in the store. It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Dave, same thing. Protein, I use mine all the time. What you guys do is some of my favorite stuff. And it's just great that you guys are right down the street in Kansas City. I assume you guys are both probably different in the way you approach Using your pedals uh, that you make, using other pedals, and and designing your pedals is probably a certain you know process that everybody has when they're creating their products. So I thought we can kind of dive into that if you want to. And <clears throat> and um, Zach, if you want to go first, like what, what do you think? What what's the approach that you go with when you're considering a circuit to kind of you know, you're wanting to go for, and when you when you're getting into building, like what, what kind of approach do you do you usually use? Right. I mean, if if it doesn't have like a specific job like a chorus yeah you know I, I think we get in the weeds mostly on drive sort of circuits because you lose your mind going into how to do everything because there's so many different ways to amplify and create an overdrive fuzz or whatever mm -hmm. but for me it all kind of starts with with the end mm -hmm. I live in yeah. illustrator in my computer yeah. and I, I yeah. kind of envision how I want it to look as a finished product yep. and that sort of personality and the characteristics that that the control layout or the, the options kind of give you as a, as, as a user mm -hmm. and then work backwards from there. But sonically, I, I will just start with um, whatever the, the intention is, what's the goal mm -hmm. for the circuit? Do you want it to be something that is brash in your yeah. face or more responsive and subdued? And it, it's it's a long hard road that I, I surround myself with people who are way smarter than me, <laughs> so I can ask a lot of questions to figure out the subtleties. Like how do I get this to compress right, or how do I get this to respond right? But for me, it always I, I start at the end. That's that's such an interesting answer because I I hire people to help me with aesthetics. Okay. So I I spent a lot of years um, building amplifiers and modifying amplifiers and. Figuring out how to, um, when somebody would say, "Oh, I want it to do, I want it to be a little more saggy, or a little more fuzzy, or I want it to um, a, a little more low end, a little less high end, a little more high mid," you know, trying to figure out how to accomplish these things that people are asking for. Um, I'm working with an artist right now. We're we're playing around with a circuit, and, and he sent me some notes. He's like, "I really wish this part of it did this thing," and so my brain has been in like hyper spinning of like, how do I? electronically make what he asked for happen and mm -hmm. I really love where those two things collide mm -hmm. yeah yeah so I'm more of a function than a form guy but um, I really do care about how things look but that, yeah. that to me that's like the second part of like yeah. okay how do we make it look cool sure it's, 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 it's so incredibly hard to like distill down what someone's description of a, yeah. of a feeling is because everyone interprets sag different or yeah brightness different or presence so mm -hmm. it's it can it's really hard to actually actualize yeah. that as a designer because especially if you're working with an artist because some artists are it's just smooth sailing they say that's great from the first iteration and then the next guy will you'll just cry over powder coat colors or the, how far the knobs are apart and then the sound is it's, Entirely an animal, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, well, cool, man. So I guess when um, you have a new pedal out, uh, new ish, the yes. new ish, the Fates. Yes. Um, that one. What? So you you really haven't done anything wiggly like that. <laughs> so what? Yeah. Your uh, what drove you to to do for us? Well, you know, I've always wanted uh, to have a modulation, and as like I was saying before, and I was semi-joking, but I don't really play pedals all that much. 
Um, Cause it's, for me, playing guitar is just about this and that, and this is just extra on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, so the chorus was something to fill a need as a brand, but also to kind of capture something that I love, which is the classic Japanese boss CE2 <clears throat> circuit. And so I just wanted something that had that personality and characteristic and push it into the mythos way with how, it's, how it responds to you as a player. Because mm -hmm. it all, and I'm sure you feel this way too, it lives and dies in how it feels under your fingers. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't yeah. give back, yeah. just like a good amp, just like a good guitar, then it just sits on the prototype shelf for me. Mm -hmm. But the chorus was just, I, I, I needed to grow the lineup yeah. to yeah. appeal to a wider audience because I felt like we were at the point as a brand where we had to do that. Mm -hmm. And I love it. So the Fates, like I said, is CE2. And my favorite thing, because I, I don't play guitar to, uh, I, I, I'm using effects, like I said, just to spice up my playing. So I like it to just kind of widen up my sound. everything and get bigger and then the more you kind of increase that rate you can get those pseudo like that sort of thing get the Leslie thing and then of course we we, we had a guy that worked for us who was a younger guy he said you have to have pitch vibrato I'm like that sounds weird man I don't know if I like that yeah. but we did it <laughs> And it, it has another, it kind of sounds like a, um, a vibratone, like the yeah. Fender yeah. thing. Uh, but if you make it a little more extreme, then you're getting into... Which, that is not me. And honestly, that is the first sound that's ever existed in anything I've ever made that is not something I like. But, it's just people like it and yeah. make use of it. But yeah. that's, that's the faith. And it's fun because you can get those kind of Schofield sort of weird things. But well, so you were playing earlier when you got here. I think uh, or maybe I saw it on maybe it was on uh, the video mm -hmm. that you posted last night. Playing some ZZ Top. Yes, of course. Did Billy use the chorus on some of those weird things? Well, because it kind of sounds. I always wondered if he did because it, <clears throat> he's playing probably through his deluxe, and it sound, those amps have like a real kind of bloomy sort of 3D sound anyhow, yeah. when they're, when they're clean-ish. Well, on the later stuff, he definitely there's definitely some yeah. rack effects happening. Sure, But yeah. the early sounds, everyone says, oh, it's it's one guitar detuned a little bit, so uh, it creates this sort of yeah. chorus effect. Mm -hmm. But to me, I, he probably did that. To me, it sounds like a braked Leslie cabinet. Oh, sure, uh, yeah. So if you do... Yeah. Just kind of like, the, kind of like how I had this set at the beginning. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, you know, I'm going to turn off the Chupacabra. Step back. And even that's a little too extreme. Just a little bit. It, it just has kind of that 70s ZZ Top sound. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a little more wet than what people would use. Yeah. But I, the, the, those are the... Those are the Dragons I'm chasing as a builder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mostly led by Billy Gibbons. Yeah. <laughs> during the time. Yeah, I think you guys came out the version of uh, the Carbon. It's the yeah. most recent thing. Did that come out of like working with people or getting feedback from people as far as having the switch it, uh, added to it? It came out of another project, that, the other project that I was talking about that I'm working with an artist yeah. on building something, and that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I incorporated that into what I'm building with him and went, oh man, I love that. I yeah. want that on the, I want that on the carbon now too. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're kicking around, do we need to do that? To, do we need to add that to the protein? I don't know. I haven't decided yeah. yet. Yeah. yeah. I'll take votes. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Excellent. There's a, there's a slippery slope to revision. Oh man. And, and, and this is something that when you're a brand and you release a new product, like we just released the chorus, and as soon as it's out, everyone says, I wish it had, yeah. man, if it only had. It's like, you can just, get, just give it a chance, please. But it, also, as a maker, you just constantly, you find little easier pathways to make things and improve things. Sure. And so the need to, the, 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 the dilemma of, should I revise this and, and release a, yet another version into the world is so incredibly, uh, stressful. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Better or just different? Yeah. On the carbon, 
Yes. Sir. Um, with the switch, so there's the stock carbon, which we all really like. Um, tell me about the switch and how uh, one would use that, probably for higher gain settings. So when you're stacking, um, you know, the big thing for the protein, for me, for Adam, what we were after um, was three sounds out of two drives. Um, and, you know, it was really the Analog Man King of Tone was the first one that I ever played back, you know, 25 years ago, whatever, that kind of blew my mind that you can stack two drive pedals and get a third sound that's really compressed and uh, kind of sounds like you've got an amp that's turned up because I was playing in a lot of musical situations where I couldn't turn an amp up. Um, and so if you can't turn up your amp, you kind of have this kind of sterile thing going on. I'm going to be running this thing barely open. But then I can kick this on, I start to get some of that feel and some of that magic back, like if the amp was turned up. And then what we were going for with the two of them was to be able to turn them both on without having it mush out and fall apart and you know like this gross sound that you get when you often turn two drive pedals on so the switch for the carbon this would be stock and then we just gave an option to take some top off and it's really subtle because i i almost didn't wasn't going to do it. Like I don't. I love the high end of the blue side of the protein or the carbon because it's got all this air around it and it's got this compression to it and it kind of gives you like the drive sound like a, if you had a cranked AC30, it's a really killer rhythm sound or a light gain lead sound, it pokes through in a mix when you turn it on. But sometimes, especially if you're playing through a bright amp, like I'm through the, the bright channel of this Rock Hill and it's, it sounds awesome and it's nice and bright. If I start to gain up this carbon, it can start to get a little strong. So the ability to roll a little tiny bit of high end off yeah. is, is nice. And it's subtle. Yeah. It's something that it's, it's almost hard to hear in this room, but if your ears or if you're playing live, you really start to notice it. So that was, that was what that was. And especially in a stack situation, you start to really notice it. If you're hitting multiple game stages, you need to take off a little bit of high end. Protein, uh, I know we're talking about the carbon side, but the protein, <clears throat> you said, when you mentioned that it has like three three settings. Yes. The third setting being both on at the same time. Right. The thing I've noticed when you're stacking pedals, pedals, you know, you're getting the flavor of whatever one, mostly as, 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 at the end, you know, or the second one is the shape. That pedal I've noticed, it always, to me, it just sounds like both pedals do this. It's not like one into the other. In fact, the order, I don't even, I mean, when I turn it on, it just sounds like that, and like it's just kind of turned into this complex kind of air rock thing. Right. Which is really cool. So, so the classic blues breaker is an awesome circuit. It's a really fun circuit to modify and, and play with. Um, and that's kind of where we were going for with the blues side, but to me it needed, uh, it needed a whole lot more than what it had, and so we added circuitry to it to give it more headroom, more compression, and way, way more output. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the uh, amplification side of the blue side of the protein is yeah. massive, and it's just way turned down. Yeah. And so that's the reason that um, it's got character of its own, but when you hit it with the green side, it, it's kind of, I hate the word transparent, but it doesn't get in the way a whole lot, and it doesn't uh, choke out the low end, and it can handle being hit with a lot of gain, and that's why it's the second. You know, I've had a lot of people say, "Well, you do an order toggle, or why did you do the yeah. flip flop? It you did it wrong." Yeah. And I've always just said, "Thank you, appreciate your feedback." <laughs> yeah. um, but it's very intentional. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> well, and, I was going to say, there's something about like everyone um, idolizes that original Bluesbreaker pedal, mm -hmm. and you spend a lot of money, and now Marshall's reissued it. 
But it it, um, it kind of stinks. Like it makes like one good sound, and you're like, oh, that sounds great. And then the moment you turn the knobs, it's like, so the, it it is ripe for transformation. And it needs volume more than like, literally any. Yeah. yeah, and it's bright too. <clears throat> so, but the volume, it's weak. It's a weak pedal. It's a weak pedal. It sounds awesome into like a steel string singer, right? Right. Yeah. With like, is that Do you have John? one of those too? <laughs> <laughs> I built them. Uh, but I think that's what John was using, right? Yeah. The like the continuum sound that everybody was after. It's like, well, yeah. If you if you've got a great strap and a wound out ampeg or some massive headroom amplifier, Rex, what is that? What's that? What are you playing with right now? A V? Is it a V four? V two? You got some, you know huge output section amp, and then a blues breaker is awesome and magical, and you know, some great digital reverb and all that, you can get right there to that John Mayer yeah. port. Yeah, for sure. I really dig everything that you guys both do, but the, one of the bigger reasons is I, I write the volume on my guitar all the time yeah. when I'm using overdrives. It's like when I do sound check with my band, I'll get everything kind of set, and I have my, have my guitar, and I'm like, okay, well, this everything sounds good, and then I'll put my volume down like two notches. Right. And I'll have everything basically set for that. So then when I go to take a solo, I can hit the boost or whatever, and it brings it up. If I want more grip with that, I can just I have two more, two more from eight to 10. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so both of your pedal, the overdrives you guys make clean up really well. Mm -hmm. And so I know you usually run your amps pretty gassed up. Yeah. And then use pedals to kind of add on to that. Yeah. Um, so when you're designing, I guess your pedals, you're probably designing them kind of to work that way. Yeah, I, I think for me, like I said, like the pedals are just to accent the playing yeah. for me as a player. And so my amp, if I were to have this deluxe set how I set it, you guys would be all over in that room because it just I just like it to have that heat and then this just takes it to that yeah. next level. But mm -hmm. there is something that I think when you get a pedal that is responsive, it's, it's pretty transformative to your playing because it'll kind of lead you to start using these things more and realize how important it is and how that's how all our heroes right. did it. Okay. Yeah, totally. you know, this is, everyone says, you know, this is old school channel switching on the old Les Paul, you know, you have it on eight, that's your normal sound, and boom, 10, it's, you know, it's really hitting hard. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, if things don't clean up well for me, it yeah. sometimes goes yeah. on the shelf or it, it has to be so intentioned and the sound of it is so specific to achieve, like a big muff, you know, sometimes yeah, yeah. they clean up, not every, it's not right. the same. Yeah. But, yeah, I, it, it's it's kind of a prerequisite for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So some pedals have a certain sound, where, like you said, where it's like, well, I've been. This is part of I've been playing a gig, and I want this sound. It's an effect. It's an effect. Yeah. Yes. And do I want this to take up real estate on my board? You know, like right. I kind of need it, so yes. But there are things like the Olympus. I've really been re-falling in love with sure. and using it a lot with my old Vibrolux. It does that really well, uh, yeah. the, the, the cleaning up, and it just sounds like a, a good broken amp. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it works really well. And that's something that, like I said, I want everything to kind of live in that space. This one's interesting because the, the two, the gain and the presence, the tone controls are very interactive. Yeah. So like if you were treating this like an amp, you'd have it, if my guitar is on eight now. That sort of thing. And that, that to me is, that's what it's all about. Like playing, letting that just be an extension of your hand. Yeah, yeah, totally. 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 What pedal was that you were just playing? That's, that's the Olympus. Okay. <clears throat> so it's uh, it's based off the old Clark Gangster, which was it was made with amplifier parts and it was, it was this big. Like I'm not exaggerating, it's huge. You know, like seven hundred dollars. And I got my hands on one, and it was it was so interesting and cool. And um, I, I tweaked it so this has a little bit more gain and uh, a little more low end. That it's kind of a Thin circuit. It's almost like an OD1 in a way, kind of. But it's a just a really fun, and that's that's all the gain it has. Like for an overdrive or a distortion, you know, it's not like it's not that juiced up. But most people run it kind of as as a booster. It's, it's a real low gain. Yeah. Brought it into that, Steve. 
I, well, I can't turn my hand over. So <laughs> yeah, when I was when I was I've told this story so many times. When I was a kid, I was jumping on the bed and it fell off, and I broke both bones in my wrist. And so now my left hand only turns halfway over. And so my guitar teacher was this little guy. He was, was like a guitar Yoda. Yeah. Uh, and he said, uh, well, you can't, you can't play bar chords. I have to play with my thumb. Um, you can't ever sweep a pick. <laughs> you can't do all these things. Yeah. So just, just watch TV and go. Yeah. Just do that until your parents say, stop. And so that's what I did. <laughs> it's awesome. When I ran into you, I played a gig last month, and I brought, it was kind of ridiculous. It was like more of a concert type of setting. And I brought five guitars. One of them was uh, like 335, so that was my 35. I played that predominantly in most of the first set, but in the second set, I played a little bit of that, and then I switched to my telly, and I was like, I literally could not hear it. I had my amp in the back, and it was roaring. I switched to single coils, and I like it, I'm at the mercy of the monitor, and I'm like, it was it was on, but it just wasn't loud enough. And I came back to the store, and I told the guys about that, and I'm like, I needed one of those, the fixer. So tell me about that. The, the fixer was um, a double-edged sword. One, I had a lot of um, guitar players that I work with, guys, friends, whatever, say, what buffer do you like? And mm -hmm. my answer would always be, I, I don't like any of them. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't want to lose low end. I don't want, but, but there was one circuit that I played with that once I put it on my pedal board, um, Every time I took it off or took it out of the chain, I was really bummed that it was gone. And I was like, well, that, um, especially in the situation where you can't turn the amp up or you're, you know, a lot of it is, is dealing with um, live scenarios that are frustrating to deal with where the sound guy's like, you're killing everybody in the front row, can you turn that down or whatever. So the buffer thing was, was a big deal. So I decided to build a, a buffer pedal for everybody who'd asked me for one yeah and that is what's in there first um, also I don't think that tuner pedals typically sound good so I don't want them in my chain or in any guitar player that I'm working for I don't want it in their chain if I'm building pedal boards or yeah. touring with somebody so it's got a dedicated tuner out and because it's uh, because it's buffered and the impedance is correct you don't lose anything by splitting the output and then the second thing was um, I didn't want to lose any uh, any gain by using that buffer so I decided to put a boost after it and I decided well if I'm going to put a boost after it I'll just put two of them and I'll make them switchable so that if you are trying to play a Les Paul and a Tele or a you know a humbucker guitar and a single coil guitar yeah. you can fix that by setting one to be the you know kind of the unity gain sound for yeah. that guitar and the other one bring it up to whatever your loudest guitar is mm -hmm. so you can use a Tele and a Les Paul yeah. in a gig without having to go back and turn up the amp or asking the monitor guy or the sound. Because a lot of guys that um, I've toured with or worked with, they don't have a monitor guy. They have yeah. one sound guy. Yeah, same, um, yeah. And asking for a monitor change, mm -hmm. it's, you're not getting it. Anymore. Let's hear it. Yeah. Well, well it does kind of... You know what's interesting? Um, typically, we don't have... It doesn't, it doesn't have a bypass on it. It has a mute. So you can mute tune. The fixer doesn't have a bypass, so you can't really hear the guitar without the fixer. So you can hear how um, you turn that buffer on and you get a little more rubber bandy. It, it gives back when you're... It's harder to hear but easier to feel. Yeah. Bring some of that resistance back and feels a little more like you're plugged straight into a guitar amp. Mm -hmm. um, and if you've ever gone from plugging straight into your guitar amp to plugging through a whole bunch of pedals and, and you just noticed that the feel was completely different, that's what a buffer, a good mm -hmm. buffer will do is it will bring that back. So you're not hearing a huge difference, um, but you also have the ability a little more gain. It does clip nicely. Or you can take a louder guitar and drop it down a little bit if you don't want it to hit your amp. 
So it's not an overdrive, but it, it yeah. will act like one. And if you uh, have other drive pedals on, like this is the gridded door. Last year, let's hear it. I got some weird stuff. So, some weird stuff. the weirdest thing I make is called the Hephaestus, which no one can pronounce because I'm not good at picking product names. <laughs> but it's based off old Jordan Boston, the little fuzz you plug in your guitar. And I was making that, and I'm like, this is a cool fuzz, but it kind of does similar things to our Golden Fleece. So, I took a pot and some wires and started poking and prodding and realized if that I adjusted the voltage, that I could get it to sub octave. Uh, so, it's a sub octave fuzz. All the way up, it sounds like this. It kind of sounds like the spirit in the sky. My potted pickups, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but if you if you roll the warning knob back. the octave becomes present and the less the gain is uh, kind of showing through. And if you pair that with a chorus and a delay, you kind of get like a synth. Uh, and it also kind of has like a fourth harmonic. It's, it's a I don't know. <laughs> That's the name of our band, man. Uh, yeah. The fourth harmonic. Oh. Uh, and then we also released the Cestus. So in our Sus Mariosa, that's um, RJ Ronquillo's signature pedal. Uh, he wanted a treble booster, but he wanted it to be repeatable, so I made a silicon treble booster. It was so good in that pedal that we made it a standalone unit. So if we run an overdrive, or it's just some sort of push sound, you get. Just that sort of bass overdrive. But if you hit it with a treble boost, um, so it, it's, it's super honky and pokey in the treble boost thing. That's what they sound like in classic ones. But we added the, the cap input cap switch so you can make it a little more mid forward. And the way I think of it is if we, like, I'll treat one of these pedals as kind of a master volume here. I want to turn the Cestus up. Yep. So, in treble boost mode, it's kind of like Queen. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And so, like you said, with, with the, using it your like as a master volume on your overdrive pedal. Yeah, I've done that before. You got to be careful. <laughs> Make sure that other pedal is on and you hit it. Otherwise, you'll blow people away in the yes. front. But yeah, that works really well. That sounds great. Yeah, and it's just a fun thing to stack. But just like all the kind of the shortcomings of vintage circuits, it, you know, the impedance has to be right. Or if, if something is in front of it, like a buffer, it just freaks out. It sounds really bad. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's just. It's for the guys that want to play marshals and or really high gain stuff and just send it into yep. the stratosphere, so to speak. But those are the newest pedals mm -hmm. that we've got going. Well, do you have two different versions of the Argo? So on? okay, so we have the Argo, which, which I love. The Argo, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, Thanks. I have one. Love it. So it's octave up fuzz. It has a blend. <laughs> just like a green ringer just to octave up. So the idea is, is that if you pair it with a drive you like, then you can get the pseudo octave up. That sound, I always think, and I know he's a football player, but I think of like gronk. <laughs> yeah, gronk. It's, it's real gronky. Uh, if you play harmonics, it kind of sounds like a really terrible steel drum. Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting sound. It, it, and they work in different ways all along with the fretboard of the guitar. Yeah. And let's open it for any questions. Anybody have any questions for either Dave or, or uh, what's your name again? Seth? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. First of all, thank you guys for being here and hosting it. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. <coughs> thank you for coming all over to Nashville. Sure. Um, I just want to make a statement. So, what I love about Mythos pedals is not only the colors, the script, but I love the um, just the minimalism of the board because mm -hmm. of, of the, the uh, enclosure because it's easy to maneuver. Um, plus, the single knobs really forces me to use my tone and body knobs, yeah. which yeah. really can really shift the tone. Yeah, I, I just really love that kind of that look too. The simple, the simpleness of it. Well, like I said, when I'm putting them in the computer, one of my first thoughts is, can I reach this knob with my foot? Yeah. Because uh, exactly. if you're at a gig and we've all been there, you kind of have to. And so that's the knob selection and layout is very, very much is it is it within a toe distance? Yeah. Well, 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 and to your comment about you know reminding you to use the volume and the tone knob on your guitar it's like that made me think of uh i remember somebody came in one time and, and they were like well this pedal this overdrive pedal they bought they were like it just doesn't it's not bright enough and i was like oh okay well let's plug it in real fast and you kind of show me kind of what you're thinking and we can go for finding something else for you well he didn't have the he never turned the tone or the treble all the way up like okay. that's a setting too you know yeah. and uh, i turned it all the way up and he goes that actually says sound really good. And he goes, I just never even thought to just go ahead and max that out. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, it's a setting that's there, so just use it, you know. And, and there are certain pedals that I do that. I mean, especially with my old Marshall, mm -hmm. some things are all the way off, some things are all the way up, just to make it sound, you know, to where you, where you want it, you know. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, totally. Yeah. Don't be afraid to turn a knob all the way down or up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yep. it's there for a reason. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's definitely something we think about when we're designing. I I, I would like it to be to sound great with all the knobs. Eat, like where you would like starting place, right? Sure, yeah. Everything straight up. But I want every knob to be able to be turned up all the way without it yeah. going sounding bad or right. being. I mean, there's obviously unusable sounds. You can you could find one, but sure, right, as little as possible. Yep. When you're looking at making a new pedal, right, um, from a quote unquote inspiration standpoint, um, what's your thought process, and is it kind of like? Okay, we've got all these circuits that have been around for forever, but I just wish it did one extra thing, so I'm going to make that. Or is it like, man, I love how this guitarist works this, I'm going to make that. Or is it just, you know what, I want to make something nobody's ever heard before. Like, how do you, I don't know, it's kind of an all-encompassing question, so I apologize for how long it is. But um, I guess what's your approach when wanting to create a new product in a world that has a lot of really great options already? How do you both look at that and go, okay, I want to do something that is, in theory, going to add to the guitar pedal community, right? Not just do the same old thing, but not also take from what I'm building upon. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm sorry. I don't know what to say. 
It's a big question. You go first. I go first. <laughs> I, I think it's a really good question because um, the art, when we decided to come out with the T4, I went through a lot of internal, why on earth do we need another big muff operation? There's a million of them, there's a lot of good ones. Yeah. But um, uh, Josh, Scott actually encouraged me to release it. He heard it, he liked it, he's like, man, you need to put that out, that pedal's awesome. And so when I started going and looking through my um, schematics, I had a folder that I pulled out that had about 25 hand-drawn Big Muff schematics of circuits that I had played with over the years to land on what I liked the best. And that kind of um, helped me like take a deep breath and go, you know what, you spent a lot of time dialing this circuit to be exactly what you want and for what you want it to do it does that and nothing else does exactly that so it's it's worthy i don't know but you know other times it's completely different i've, I've got a pedal that i've still never built it's three pedals in one but i woke up out of a dream like i was playing this awesome pedal in this dream and you know this was a long long time ago before i started building pedals but i mean it's it's all over the place i would say yeah I, Your turn. You know, it, it's an interesting question because the, the, the why, but that, that's the ultimate question in any business, why am I going to do this? And, and concerning like releasing something, especially if it's been done before, you're always going to reach a different audience. You know, Mythos fans are Mythos fans, Brown fans are Brown fans. And there's definitely, you know, there's a Venn diagram of all pedal fans, right? But I think that the guys, that the, the big guys, because you look at like what Earthquaker did with the pose. That pedal, I remember when it came out, I was like, $99 tube? You can get a tube screamer for $99. And then it was the best selling pedal. It still is probably one of the best selling pedals they make. And it just goes to show there's room in the, in the community to make something, even if it's just a small tweak on something classic. Um, because you're reaching a different audience, you're telling a different story, and you each have your own personality. But I went through that with the, with the Fates, because it's a CE2. You know who makes the best CE2? Boss, and they still do, and it's great. But I don't make that. And so just coming to terms with that, accepting it, and that, that's, that's the biggest thing. And as far as inspiration, it's all over the place. Sometimes it comes from hearing a song. Sometimes you just think, you know, wouldn't it be neat if you had hit a pedal and it went Brah! You know, like those are the ideas that just come out of nowhere. And sometimes they amount to nothing. But you get the Hephaestus sometimes. Right? You get circuits that, that lead you in a direction you never thought you'd go down. So you just kind of have to be open to it and not be afraid to, I think the biggest thing is you can't be afraid to release something and have it fail. Because this is a, a hard space to, to succeed in. So, yeah. One other thing I'll, I will mention, because Braxton and I have been working on a chorus for too long. Uh, and it's, it's done, and, but the reason I was building it was because um, a supplier of mine had bucket brigade chips, and I, and I really love analog stuff. Um, and we're working on one, one last thing that we're trying to decide if we're going to add to it or not. But I have deliberately not played the fates yet until I deliver my file <laughs> because I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to borrow from anybody else. Like I want to make sure it came out of my brain and through my ears and finger. Oh yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. I mean, I, one of the things that I do whenever I'm like when I when I was working on the Oracle. So it's it's an original analog echo design that I hired someone way smarter than me to, to come up with the circuit. And I bought every analog echo I could. I bought an eighty eighty. I bought eighty nines, uh, DM twos, all the things so I could compare them. And, and, and then I bought a bunch of modern ones as well, because you just have to, I think for us as a maker, you have to say, is it good enough? Um, and and there's, there's a huge part of letting it go, because even it, like the biggest comparison I made for the Fates was the jam uh, that we had to Ripley Fall at the shop, which is amazing. Um, this is very different, even though they're technically, on paper, you look at it and say, oh, it's the same thing. Um, your personality and your design almost supersedes the schematic in a lot of ways. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dilemma that makers and builders have to go through. Sometimes it just has to look neat. Yeah, and that's all. If it looks neat, then it'll do just fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had a question 
what are the issues with probably the most common buffer, which is like in the boss pedal? And for you, how does your fixer interact? For example, if you have that and then lay it down your chain, you have a boss chorus or a boss X, Y, or Z. How do those interact? So your first question is, what do I not like about the boss buffer? Yes. I don't dislike the boss buffer. Um, but I'm sorry, what would you change about it? Um, I don't want to lose any low end. Um, and um, I want it to sound and feel better for having passed through that uh, electronic circuit rather than rather than not. Like a boss tuner is awesome. And if that's what you've got first in your chain, it's great. But for me personally, I wanted that tuner out of the chain and I wanted a buffer that was specifically designed to sound and and really I mean Brax and I were having this whole we were blowing each other up the other day because he's like the thing with the fixer is it's more about how it feels and how, what it does to your low end than it is about how it sounds. You can't really hear it. It's really hard to do a demo for it unless you uh, create a problem scenario with like 50 foot of cable and, and are like, look what happens if you have, because nobody's using 50 foot of cable. Mm -hmm. um, as far as how it interacts with other buffers, it's, it's not going to change them. If you've got a, a buffer that sounds good down the way, it's not going to sound any different when you put the fixer in front of it. Awesome. This is changing the impedance. <clears throat> leaving. So everything after that should be okay. Right. It's, it's corrected. Yeah. Quote unquote. Let's talk about impedance. Oh. <laughs> There's a back pedal shot. Riding a so bicycle uphill with a hose. <laughs> yeah.